Okay, it is officially noon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Iowa Learning Farms webinar. Today we're joined uh, by, or first off, hold on. My name is Elena. I'm a water and conservation educator with Iowa Learning Farms. And so today we are joined by Dara Wald and Miguel Diaz, and they're with Texas A&M University. Uh, Dara is an associate professor there, and Miguel is a PhD student. And they're gonna be talking today about motivating conservation action in the upper Midwest, linking attention, communications, and land management decisions. If you have questions at all throughout the presentation, go ahead and submit them to me in the chat and they will be answered towards the end. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Dara and Miguel. Thank you very much, Lena. It's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, so as she said, we're gonna talk about motivating conservation action um, in the upper Midwest. Um, go ahead, Miguel. So this um, today, our plan is to talk, sort of give you some context about what this study was about, give you a little bit of an overview of the theoretical framework, our methodology, results, and conclusions. Um, so this study, I should start off by saying, was funded by the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. It's part of a larger group of, of work that I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and this project, the PI on this project was Laura Witzling, um, and I was the co-PI, and then Jackie Camito was a collaborator, and this work couldn't have been done without them. So even though we're here today, this is part of a bigger team effort um, that uh, that was a really great uh, opportunity for us to work on. So there were really two drivers and motivators for this work. The first was understanding our uh, the drivers of farmers' support for voluntary conservation practices. Um, there has been work on this space before, but we thought that there were some questions that were unanswered that we pursued in this project. And the second part was to understand theoretically how individuals, whether they be farmers or, or anyone else, seeks out information about something that they perceive as risky or beneficial, how they process that information, and how they share that information. So there was both a practical side of this work and a theoretical side of this work. Go ahead. Um, so as I said, this is part of a bigger team. These are some of the members of the team, and these are the articles that so far have come out of this work. This article that, or this work that we're talking about today is actually in review as well. So um, there's been a lot of work that has gone into this project. Uh, all four of these articles are published and are available, and I'd be happy to share links with people who are interested in the other components of the work that came out of this project as well. Go ahead. So as I said, we're going to start with the context. What is this study about? Um, and what was motivating this study from a practical perspective. And so the big sort of motivator for this for this um, research is, of course, um, the issues that we're having in the Gulf of Mexico with um, uh, excess nutrients coming from agricultural land that are traveling to the Gulf via the Mississippi River, um, that there are challenges for aquatic species from an environmental perspective. Lots of challenges are created by this um, reality. But then we also have some social and economic challenges that come from this for communities in the Gulf that face cultural, ecological, and economic consequences because of the dead zone that is in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we focused on Iowa for this work, both from a practical reason, right? This was funded by the Iowa Nutrient Research um, Center, but also because Iowa is a huge part of the Mississippi River um, and Gulf of Mexico hypoxia task force. Iowa has also been a, a leader in adopting nutrient reduction strategy um, policies from in 2013. Um, the nutrient reduction strategy began, and that was really focused a lot of it on agricultural conservation practices, motivating those conservation practices to reduce nutrient runoff. Uh, and so we, we focused on Iowa for both practical reasons, but also because it's very important contributor to, um, to the Gulf of Mexico dead zone. One of the one of the key parts, and and I would say I would venture to say, uh, um, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, sources of contention uh, in um, how we manage nutrient runoff in Iowa and in other parts of the U.S. has been this this question about do we manage them through voluntary practices or do we create regulation, um, and so. There, on a positive note, has been a lot of support identified among farmers for conservation practices uh, and a lot of evidence that farmers are willing to adopt conservation practices for voluntary, um, either voluntarily or through paid um, incentive programs. But at the same time, there have been uh, there's evidence in the Midwest and, and um, other places that 
agricultural audiences are critical of policies and regulations, that they don't want those policies and regulations, um, particularly if they're focused on environmental action, even though on a large, from a larger uh, in a larger context, agricultural audiences are often supportive of water quality practices. Um, so there's been this tension for a long time. Uh, and so one of the things that we need to know as a result of that is what are the levers that would encourage farmers to adopt these practices from a from a voluntary perspective, right, if there's tension over regulation. And so we know that there is an association between adoption of conservation practices and three, at least three sort of tools that we use to engage uh, agricultural audiences. One is extension training, two is connection to conservation organizations, and three are financial, financial incentives. And at the root of all three of these things is communication, right? Education training is about communicating ideas, um, facilitating learning through communication about uh, examples or papers, or white papers, gray, gray literature, um, but also face-to-face -face communication. Connecting to conservation organizations also happens through public engagement and communication. And of course, financial incentives are communicated to farmers, right? And so we have to find ways, we have to understand better how information is being communicated about conservation practices in order to understand why farmers adopt them or not. And so this motivating question for this particular component of this larger research project was what's the role of communications in the adoption process? And particularly, we drilled down and we looked at information sources. What are information sources that are out there and how do those information sources shape farmers' concerns about conservation practices, their perceptions of the risks and benefits associated with conservation practices, and their adoption behaviors? And so if you look at the bottom, we have a bunch of different figures, and these are representing broadly the groups of information sources that we looked at, and I'll explain exactly what those are moving forward. And so taking those as our big motivating questions, we developed a theoretical framework for this work. And that was around this idea of what are the different media sources that have been identified as important infer, uh, filters of information in other environmental and agricultural issues? And how do those media sources apply when it comes to the adoption of behavior around conservation practices? So for example, we've seen that media was important in public perceptions of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, uh, in um, perceptions of mad cow disease, in perceptions of genetically modified foods. So we developed a, a theoretical framework using these as our these studies as our guiding um, sort of light as it, as it will. Um, and you'll see on the left hand side, um, this is what a, a model basically so scientists think about like, okay, we, what's what's a model that could represent the reality here? And so we created this model that represents our reality for this study. It's in, you know, all models are, are, um, are limiting in some ways, but this is the model that we use to conceptualize this study. And so we took the list of different media sources that other people have said, or different information sources that other people have said are important, things like broadcast media or social media, newspapers. And then we took agricultural media sources like newspapers, ag businesses, and ag associations. And then we also identified, especially in the spaces of incentives, government has been a big part of that. And then we have organizations that are practice focused. These could be things like um, Iowa Learning Farms or Iowa, um, I'm blanking on the other group, but Iowa Learning Farms is a good one where they focus on specific practices. That's not a perfect conceptualization for what they do, but that's an example of one that comes, comes to mind. And then we also looked at interpersonal sources. And this is something that hasn't been looked at really before in this context. Uh, and it's it's stuff that, um, it's work that comes out of the Arbuckle's lab and other folks lab that suggests that farmers really lean very heavily on their family and their friends and other farmers who've been doing work in this space. And so we included interpersonal sources in our, in our model as well. And we hypothesize that all of those sources of information shape farmers' concerns about conservation practices or their interest in conservation practices. And then we hypothesize that those concerns influence their perception of the risks, right? The economic risks, the environmental risks uh, of water quality practices and the benefits that they might perceive from these practices. And that those risks and benefits that they perceive shape their willingness to share information or seek out information about conservation practices. And ultimately, all of that, we hypothesize, influences their ability or their willingness, excuse me, to adopt 
practices. So that's our basic theoretical model. And we have a bunch of hypotheses in here. I won't go through all of them for time. Again, this article is in review and be happy to share it once it's published. And these are those hypotheses. As I said, we didn't have a clear hypothesis for our interpersonal communication question because a lot of that work hasn't been done yet. And so this is really a research question, which is how do interpersonal communication, how is that associated with all the variables in our model? All right, so Miguel, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Well, now I'm gonna talk about the methods and the results that we got from this study. And just to start, uh, we, we use a survey that was distributed by Iowa Learning Farms. It was uh, in 20, 2021. And our target population were Iowa farmers and landowners. And we have, or we set two different criteria for exclusion or inclusion of participants in the study. The first one was that during 2017 or 2019, they should have attend at least one face-to-face -face field day. And if not, during 2020, during the pandemic year, they should have a, attend at least one virtual field day. Probably 1,200 surveys were sent out and we got back 474 complete surveys. So the results are from those uh, complete surveys that we got. And now I'm gonna explain some of the questions posed in that survey. You, we use question five to understand or to know which, uh, which conservation practices farmers were currently using their farms. And for example, we have riparian buffers, terraces, ponds, and they have to choose between no, yes, or not sure, if they were not sure that they were using that uh, conservation practice in their land. Now, question seven. We use question seven to measure the perceptions of, B, of risks and benefits that uh, farmers had about uh, conservation practices. So in the first group, the first five uh, items in the left are regarding uh, risk perceptions. For example, that is installing or maintaining them are costly or difficult, or that they can reduce yield. And the last three at the bottom are perception, perceptions of benefits, like they can increase yield, they can improve soil health, or they can improve water quality. Then, Question nine, we use question nine to assess the level of concern that the farmers have about water quality in different like geographical scales. Like for example, excess nitrate in my county's waterway or excess nitrate in my county's drinking water, the same for Iowa. And like the general geographical scale was excess nitrate in the Gulf of Mexico. And they have like five different point, uh, points in the scale for measure that the concern from not at all concern till extremely concerned. Then question 11, uh, here we have like uh, two different communicational behaviors, information sharing and information seeking. And it was related to how often they share their views or the information with other farmers or how often they ask for, inf they ask for information with, uh, for other farmers or like in, in general media. And finally, our last set of questions was about attention. And the question reads, how much attention do you pay to information about agriculture from the following? We designed like five different uh, categories, but we also create subgroups inside of those categories. For example, family, friends, and farmers, we group them like interpersonal sources, news on TV and news on radio, like broadcasting media, and we also have in the right a different kind of print media, agricultural and regular print media. We include also like commodity associations, for example, the Iowa Soybean Association or the Iowa Cattlemen's Association. And in the left, we have different organizations from the government, universities, and also NGOs. The different point in the scales was like a Non, like remember that the, the question was how much attention? So they could answer none, very little, some, quite a bit, or a great deal. And now I'm gonna talk about the results. So basically like the general characteristics of our sample was that 90% of them were male, 98% were white. About age, the average was 63. The younger participant in the survey was 24 years old and the older was 72. And for political views, like the big two groups were 
conservative with 37% and independent with 26%. Another demographic uh, facts to talk about, for example, education, 31% of the sample had a four-year degree. The income was in the range of $75,000 to $149,000 before taxes in 2020. And the top four uh, conservation practices that they report that they were using were terraces, strategically placed prairie or perennials, ponds, and riparian buffers. This is our general table for the results, but I will split that table like in little, in little pieces. This is the first one. And here, basically you just need to check the numbers with starts or with asterisks, because the start indicates that there is an important association between those two variables. For example, here we can see that age and concern are like associated in a positive way meaning that the older the farmer, the more concern they have toward water, uh, water quality. The same with education, the higher the education, the more concern and also the more adoption of the practice. And here we start with our different sources of information. In this case, we just have three, uh, three variables with asterisk, ag associations, universities and practice focus organizations. In the case of ag associations, you can see that there is a negative sign in the number, meaning that the, the association between, the, between those two variables are negative. For example, if more, more attention to the agricultural associations will reflect a less concern about water quality. And in the case of university and practice focus organization is positive. The more attention to university or government entities or practice focus organization, the more concern the farmers uh, are reporting. Now, the same, but with perceived benefits and perceived risks. In the right, you will see that there is no uh, like important associations, but in the left, in the, the table at the left, you will see that again, we have agricultural associations and university governments. Agri agricultural associations with a negative association with the, the perceptions of benefits and the government and universities with positive associations meaning that the more attention to the universities, the more uh, benefits perceived from those practices. And here we have three different behaviors, information seeking, information sharing, and practice adoption. In this case, we identify that attention to social media, to university and government and practice uh, focus organizations, uh, have a positive association with the uh, information seeking and information sharing. And in the case of newspaper, just regular newspaper, not agricultural, but just regular newspaper are also positively associated with the behavior of seek for information. Then here we have like a little bit uh, different table and here we are um, associating concern with those different variables at the top. We found that the that the higher the concern, the more perceived benefits from the farmers, the higher the concern, they will also seek and share more information. And finally, you remember that Dr. Wald told us about the importance of interpersonal sources of information. And here uh, in these results, we found that the attention to interpersonal sources have positive, uh, like a positive association with the level of concern uh, that farmers have to water quality. And also the attention to interpersonal sources have an impact in different behaviors in the information seeking, information sharing, and the adoption of those conservation practices. Great, Miguel, thank you so much. So I'm gonna continue with discussions and conclusions with the goal of us having enough time to answer some of the questions that are coming in the chat, which are great, please keep those up. Um, so uh, remember our purpose was both the practical side to, to understand the drivers of farmer support for these conservation practices and policies, and from a, from a theoretical side to understand the pathways for more effective communication and engagement with farmers, which is actually both practical and theoretical if you think about it. Um, but I'm always thinking with my communication theory hat on as well. And so how can we sort of broadly, more broadly, think about what works from a communication and engagement standpoint? Um, go ahead, Miguel. 
And so um, remember that one of our goals here was theoretical, and we really framed this work as connected to our understanding of social amplification of risk framework. And this is important when we think about how do we get, you know, um, how do we understand where people weigh and measure risks and benefits? And one of the things that's really interesting about work in this space is that people, other scholars have found that highlighting the perceived benefits of something can actually have a really strong association um, with outcomes of behavior. And so when we think about risk a lot, one of the things that we other people have found and we found in this work is that perceived benefits also, also matter. The other thing that we found um, in this work is that there seems to be um, some bias, some skew in the way that um, participants are consuming agricultural information and some strong associations with different groups in this in in source in terms of the sources. Um, so one of the things that previous work from this same same series of articles has found is that agricultural outlets are less likely to use frames that highlight environmental risks and uncertainty compared to more urban newspapers. And we're finding that trend in our in our in our data in terms of associations between perceptions of concerns about the environment and about water quality and uh, attention to different uh, agricultural outlets. And so that tells us that there is a communication difference in the way that those things are being framed. And we need to pay attention to that because that means that farmers are likely getting really competing messages. And those messages matter because if you're paying attention more to one source of information, then you're less likely to believe a source that you pay less attention. First of all, you're less likely to be exposed to that information from a different source, but you also may be less likely to trust that information. And we actually use trust in this survey as well. And some of our data that's not included here suggests that there is also a strong correlation between what you pay attention to and what you trust. And so it's really important for, under for us to understand that those gaps exist and that we need to be paying attention to them because they're likely making it hard for some organizations to get their message about water quality concerns out to the, the audience that they're intending to get that message to, particular farmers. Um, we also want to do some more research exploring the interaction between the different sources and these conflicting messages, right? Okay, now that we know these messages are there and we know that farmers are paying attention to them in different ways, how do we make sure that the messages that we want to engage and the messages that resonate with farmers are getting out there at more frequency than the messages that um, we, we don't think are true or accurate, right? The other thing that we need to do is we need to, I think we need to move a, away from raising awareness and building and ro ro raising more, paying more attention to developing strategies that build relationships and trust with land managers. And there are some excellent examples of this already um, that I have seen in the Midwest where organizations are really trying to connect um, through trust and through uh, really saying, stepping back and saying, well, what do agricultural audiences need. I, I've, I've worked with them, so I, I'll plug Iowa Learning Farms for this. Um, I think they're doing a great job. I know there are other groups out there that are doing a great job in that space. And I think that that's an example of a, of a program that moves away from just raising awareness, which is part of what they do, but not the only part of what they do. They're really sort of trying to engage on a level of like, what do you need? And can I provide value to you, um, the farmer? And through doing that, I think you're starting to see organizations really build that trust. And I think we need to do more of that, especially from a communication standpoint, because the data seems to suggest that the more you trust an organization, the more you follow and pay attention to that organization's message. Go ahead. Um, so, so those are the main uh, conclusions, um, but I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you guys have. Thank you for your attention. All right, perfect. So before we get into all the questions really quickly, I want to go through those last couple slides there. Yes. So if you are attended today and you're hoping to get a CCA CEU credit, go ahead and email me by 5 p.m. today. My email is Alena W, A-L-E-N-A-W at iastate.edu uh, with your name, the name you entered to watch this webinar, if it was different, and then your CCA number. You can get the next slide, please. If you are tuning in for the first uh, time this year for any of our virtual events, if you could fill out this survey, it's a voluntary survey, so it's not needed, um, but it just helps give us some information. And then last slide, please. Join us next week. We've got uh, Denise Schwab. She's a beef specialist uh, with Iowa State University, 
and she's going to be talking about pasture management following a drought. So very uh, timely to this spring. Um, so again, yeah, next week, same time, noon. And then we do have a lot of questions. First question, um, we now we've done all my little advertising stuff. If you could go ahead and take it back to the contact info slide. Someone wants to get your contact info. Perfect. Um, another question we have is someone was asking, can you explain again by what you mean uh, by ag associations? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we ask these questions about how much attention do you pay to information about agriculture from the following organizations and the associations we used, again, this was Iowa focused, were the Iowa Soybean Association, the Iowa Corn Growers Association, the Iowa Cattlemen's Association, and the Iowa Pork Producers Association. Those were the four groups that we identified as associations. Perfect. Okay, so another question is, did you identify what methods that the farmers then use to share information when they come across something or what makes them more likely to share something then? Uh, I'll take the first one first. So the, the way that we asked these questions about sharing information, we said, how often are these statements true for you? And again, it was a, it was a Likert scale. So never true to always true. And we asked, I share my views about water quality with farmers. I share information about water quality with other farmers. I post on social media about water quality. I ask other farmers questions about water quality and I search for information about water quality. And these came from uh, existing literature on information seeking and sharing, um, which have been published in, in other uh, communication work. And so we we sort of modified those questions for this survey. So, um, and we did that because it makes it easier from a research perspective to make sure that your questions are good and valid and reliable, which is an important thing when you're developing a survey. Uh, and so they um, the limitation of doing that is you have a little bit less flexibility in the wording. Um, and so it's not a perfect measure, but there were some reasons that we chose this measure. Perfect. Okay, here, I've got two questions and I'm going to kind of combine them because they're both about demographics. Um, sure. One of them, people are asking, uh, was there any demographic information gathered on whether the farmer owned or rented uh, their ground or a majority of the ground? Did that have any correlations? And then kind of with that, another person is asking, um, how representative do you believe your sample was of farmers on large acre, acreages? Like, did you know um, farmed or a fraction of the income that came from crop production? So we did ask, how many overall acres do you own and or operate? And we did ask, how many row crop acres do you own or operate? We did not ask about owning or renting. And the sample that we used, so this is a, a big challenge, as those of you who know who try to survey farmers, the big challenge is where you're going to get your sample from and how you're going to make sure that it's representative. And just like many other art, um, studies in this space, this that's one of the limitations of this study. And that is that we, it's a limitation and strength. The participants from this group largely came from participants in the Iowa Learning Farms programs um, because that was the mailing list that we had access to. And so I would say it's representative of people who are participating in or associated with or who have heard of Iowa Learning Farms, but it's not necessarily representative of all farmers in the state of Iowa. Um, and, and that's something that I think we are all going to, those of us who do social science with agricultural communities or hard to reach audiences broadly need to be thinking about new ways to get um, participation so that we can have more representative and generalizable studies. And so that's certainly a limitation that we'll talk about, that we talk about in the paper. Um, and I'm, it's a good question and I'm glad you brought it up. Okay. Um, a next, another person is asking, how would you recommend conservation districts approach, approach farmers or landowners about installing conservation practices um, by selling the idea of increasing whole farm return on investment or improving whole farm water quality? Great. Miguel, can you go back to um, the results slides for me, please? Uh, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, actually, the, the last the last one. That, there we go. The, 
the ones with the adoption. Yep, perfect. So for me, <laughs> there are two big things that seem to be really important out of this result. One is that farmers who are really concerned about this issue um, and, and perceive um, benefits from conservation practices are going to find more information, going to share more information. Those are your like movers and shakers. And, you know, they may be early adopters or not, but they're certainly the people that are going to get out there and communicate. Uh, and so I would I would look for who are those people who perceive a lot of benefits from conservation um, practices and also have a lot of concerns about uh, water quality um and because those are the people that can be advocates for your program. And then the second one, Miguel, to go to the next slide, please. The other thing that I think we need to be working more on is networks, um, because these interpersonal sources of information are were the only ones that were strongly associated with the adoption of conservation practices. And so if you have a, a network of people um, and this, and some of these people may not be the people who are showing up at all the events. Um, and they may be people who have strong concerns um, and they're just doing their own thing to try to figure out um, what they can do in their community. But these are the people, these are the networks that we need to lean into of farmers that exist because it's the only factor that was significantly associated with practice adoption are these interpersonal groups. And that takes a lot of time and that takes a lot of trust building. Um, but to, to me, that's that's where we need to be focusing our efforts. Perfect. Okay, so kind of with that, um, person is saying it feels overwhelming when you think of the number of landowners and decision makers and also the number of organizations. Um, and if we do have, um, and if we have to do one with every farmer, that task can be insurmountable. So do you believe that uh, trust can be built without the individual net or individual work? I think I will say that one of the things that is clear is that in the traditional, I will say traditional media, not agricultural media outlets, there is an association between the messages that we're sending out and concern perceived benefits. And so I think that when we're doing it in the media outlets that are non-agricultural outlets, we are doing a good job with those messages. I don't, I wouldn't say that those messages need to change. If anything, I would say they just need to be um, amplified. We need to find ways to amplify those messages. I think the way that you amplify those messages and get new people on board and engaged is through those networks. Identifying who the key people in those networks are does take a lot of time, but those are your, again, those are the people who are sharing information and seeking information. Those are the interpersonal connections that seem to matter a lot. And so if you can, if you can simplify it by recognizing that the messages that you have seem to be working and we need to keep amplifying those messages, right? We don't need to necessarily change gears. We need to amplify the messages that, that do seem to be working about the risks and of, of uh, water quality issues and the benefits of adopting conservation practices. Um, that's one strategy. And then the other strategy, I think, again, to simplify it a little bit would be to find um, the communities in that space that are making a difference and really being effective and to lean into those interpersonal connections so that you can amplify your message through those networks. So I would say it's, it, it is overwhelming in some ways, but those two pathways, I think, seem to, at least from the data, again, which has its limitations, those are the strategies that I think seem to suggest that they can be effective, could be effective. Perfect. Um, so another question we have is, do you have any speculations on why ag media outlets tend to avoid discussions on environmental concerns? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, I think, I think one of the challenges is that there are for a long time, I would say for in, in, in my time frame, right. That there has been this, um, effort to, to frame environmental issues as against agricultural interests. And I don't see it that way. Um, I think you can't do one without the other. Um, and I think we need more messages that 
that build on that, more efforts that build on the shared values between agricultural and environmental issues. And I think that there have been loud voices saying that they can't work together. And in other contexts, for example, let's take something like GM foods, which I know fairly well. Um, one of the GM foods aren't politically polarized the way that climate change is politically polarized, unless you ask about the environmental impact of genetically modified foods. Um, and then you see a polarized effect. And so what that tells me is that it's not the polarizing, it's not the topic itself. It's the framing of the topic as an environmental problem uh, that then is the reason that people react to it in a polarized way. And so to me, what that means is that we need to, I think, do a better job of talking about how environmental values align with agricultural values um, and, and agricultural interests. And I don't think there's anything more fundamental than fundamentally environmental than land, water. Um, and so, or agricultural, right? You can't, you can't grow food without those things. And so I think we need to find more ways of talking about the shared values. Um, and I think that message when it's done well can resonate. And so I can't speak to all the reasons that that exists because that's probably a five hour <laughs> conversation or a semester long uh, course, but I do think it's very clear in the data that once you start talking about and framing issues as environmental and particularly regulatory, environmental regulation, um, they become very polarized. Um, and so can we think of the economic values? Can we think of the social values? Can we think even of the cultural values that are underlying the intersection between food, water, land, and even wildlife and, and focus in on those um, first? Perfect. Okay. Another person said that they um, they work with farmers and they've had great success just meeting farmers uh, where they're at, meaning like at their door with a handshake. Um, yeah. They're asking if you can comment on any work being done looking at one-on-one -on -one interactions between farmers and then resource uh, people, just anyone in yeah. the, that category. Yeah. Yes, I can. Great, great, um, great question. So, um I have a project going on right now. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, Miguel is working on that project as well, along with Emily Fuller and a couple of postdocs in my lab, um, where we're doing just that. We're going around and doing interviews, um, starting with interviews, and then we'll do um, some content analysis and a uh, survey and experiment, uh, which means an experiment that's embedded in a survey um, where we're actually looking, the, the first part is really looking at that interpersonal communication and what are the messages that are being sent out by technical and scientific sources in the agricultural space in place-based conservation efforts. And so what are the messages that farmers expect? What are the messages that farmers are hearing? What are the messages that um, uh, technical and experts uh, think they are conveying <laughs> or think they need to be conveying? And so that's, work actually, is, uh, my lab is doing a lot of work in that space right now. And the interviews have been really enlightening. We're focusing on this question of trust and credibility. And um, we're starting to see some really interesting results in that. I don't want to give too much away because it's not published yet. Um, but that work is, is, is I think, um, really exciting. And building on that, uh, we are working in partnership with Adam Jenke, who's at Iowa State, um, and Adam, for the last two years, has run a, a, a program called the Land Stewardship Leadership Academy, um, which is working with extension agents uh, and others, uh, other technical and scientific sources to um, prepare them to have conversations um, in place-based conservation contexts. And um, my work with Adam has been focused on sort of the social science of that issue, right? Like, yeah, we know a lot of technical information, but how do we have you know, challenging conversations. How do we engage a farmer effectively? Um, and I, Jay Arbuckle has given talks for that um, association as well, uh, that um, academy as well. And so there is a lot of work happening in this space that I'm very excited about. Um, one person is asking, are there any results you found surprising? They said that um, you noted that the older farm, the older the farmer is more like to be concerned about uh, water quality and more than likely to implement practices. Um, but they're saying that that seems different 
from what they've heard before and that typically they've heard that younger farmers are more open-minded to adopting conservation practices. Yeah, and that actually contradicts other data that I have from Texas, right? That 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 all of a sudden older farmers seem more concerned. So I'm not sure why that is different among this population. And that's something that we will um, continue to think about and explore. Um, and again, one of the limitations of the data is this came from a very specific sample group, right? And so maybe it's a factor of the sample itself. Maybe um, maybe there is something about uh, a generational difference in the way that people thought about land. Um, we have a couple of different hypotheses about why that might be, but I don't have a clear a clear answer for that, but it is a, a good question. Um, the other thing that's interesting that was surprising to me is just how strongly trust was associated with attention. Um, I knew that. I thought I knew that going in, but to see that we, we, we ran this model originally, we had trust in the model as a variable, but it was so strongly associated that we had to take trust out of the model. It, it, it conflate, it's called... Um, uh, VIF that we use to measure that, um, but it's an inflation factor. So basically it created problems with our model that was so strongly associated. So we had to take it out. And so I was surprised at that strength of the association because when it comes to social sciences, sometimes our models are not as clear, but that particular association was very, very clear. And so to me, it's just another reason that we need to be thinking about trust and credibility in both interpersonal communication, right? But also in the broader media landscape? How do we build trust when we are sending out our messages through news media that aren't always trusted? Um, and if you follow the national surveys like Pew or anything like that, you'll see that more and more media sources, trust has declined in media in media sources, trust has declined in po politicians since COVID. Uh, and so, you know, we do need to be thinking about how do we, what are the strategies we can use to build build trust? Okay, another person is asking questions um, kind of about the then participants of the survey. Um, and so they're asking um, kind of with the farm size thing, which also in all of Iowa Learning Farms reporting, we do report all that demographic data on farm sizes. So you can yeah. go to our website and check that out. Um, mm -hmm. But they're asking if for then your work, could you subdivide by the farm size um, to address different factors of, you know, like a small farm versus a large farm and what they're saying. And, and have you done that? Are you considering doing that? We could certainly do that. We haven't done that yet. I do have another study in Texas where we are doing that, where we are looking at the size of the farm as a, as a, as a factor. Um, I don't remember thinking back on it, why we didn't include that um, in this model, but I can certainly go back and look at that. Um, and it's certainly something I would be open to. We just had a, you know, um, We've been able to get several articles out of it. And when you, you know, you sometimes have to have to make choices in your theoretical model. And um, for the most part in this theoretical model, we use the demographics as a control. Um, and it didn't, I don't think there were any major strong associations, if I remember correctly, Miguel, but we can go back and look at that. Um, and then uh, could you also then define um, large and small farms? Did you... Um, do you have that information or like for, especially for what you're doing then in Texas or what was that point of how many acres or? Oh, I'd have to go back and look at that. Okay. I don't remember what we did offhand, but um, I will please. Uh, oh yeah. That's what I say. Yeah. As Jackie is saying in the, in the text, Texas is way different from Iowa. So I don't yeah. think it would be a good comparison um, between the two. And I don't remember uh, I'd have to go back and look at the actual data. I don't remember how we defined that. Okay, no mind. problem. Yeah. Um, another. But I can look at it. Feel free, whoever's asking. I think that may be a Jackie question. Yeah, Jackie and I can follow up via email. Perfect. Uh, how do you determine directionality and causality in your model? Yeah. So um, this is a regression model. And so one of the challenges with regression is it implies causation. Um, and that is um, not what we mean here. When we're talking about these associations, we're talking about an association, a correlation. Um, and so if we were to build this into a structural equation model, we would have to have theoretical support. It would be the theory that would drive the 
um, the building of the model and the and the relationships, right? Because the structural equation model gives you a structure. And in that structure, you're saying this drives this, drives this, drives this. From a, So we use the same idea here. And we said, theoretically, we are assuming that emotional responses shape perceived benefits and risks, which then shape information sharing and shape adoption, because that's what the theory suggests in other contexts that the associations look like. But we also recognize recognize that the model could go the other way, right? Because these are correlations, not causation. So it's a great question. Happy to talk about statistics all the time. <laughs> um, another person is asking, you'd mentioned, uh, your, or you made the statement, what messages do farmers expect? And yeah. they're asking, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So one of the things that I uh, had suggested in my um, proposal that is that was funded by NSF and um, is that technical and scientific sources, we are trained in a certain way and that training creates some assumptions and some biases for us. Um, and so when we go to engage with any member of the public, uh, even though we are members of the public ourselves, we put that scientific and technical hat on, um, then we tend to lean into the science and to the data of whatever it is we're talking about, right? And I think that scientists, I know because I've <laughs> been through that training myself, we're, we're trained to communicate that way when we go to conferences. We're trained to communicate that way when we write our grants. We're trained to communicate that way when we write our publications. And so we have expectations for our communication in our scholarly communities that we then bring into public engagement um, and uh public engagement contexts. But I think that oftentimes the strategies that we use and the things that we focus on are not always the things that our audience wants to hear from us. So for example, when pe scientists talk about things like genetically modified foods and they get asked questions about, you know, you know, genetically modified foods, they often lean into the data that says, well, you know, the data on this suggests that this and this are safe for human consumption. But if the member of the public wants to know other things about genetically modified foods, like, well, what do I do about, um, you know, the the uh, social issues associated with the proliferation of genetically modified foods? Or what do I do about X, Y, or Z? And we can't answer those questions because we're not trained to answer those questions, or it's outside of our expertise area, then we're not meeting the public's expectations. Um, and the other thing I think that is true is that many of the scientists, they go into communicating thinking about, I need to communicate my expertise first. And I think that oftentimes when we're having these conversations specifically about place-based conservation or things that farmers could do on their land, I think farmers often first and foremost wanna know why this practice would be beneficial to them. And if their expectations are, how is this gonna benefit me? But my expectation is, or my plan is to communicate the science and data, then I'm not meeting them where they're at. Um, I'm not meeting what they expect. And I think that sets up tension, that can create tension. And again, that's why we're doing these interviews is to very, to see if I'm, you know, to see if, if my hypothesis stands, right? If I'm actually accurately um, viewing that, that that situation. Uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe they are, we are meeting their expectations, but um, I've, I've had, a, I've had, I have some preliminary data to suggest that we're, we may not be. And, and that's kind of, I don't know if that answered that question, but that's sort of what I'm trying to do. And, I, and I'm being a little vague here because that data is very new. Um, another person is saying that they are finding that uh, not all farmers fit into the stereotype or categories that we typically uh, conservation professionals have been taught to give them. Can you give advice about ways to limit your own bias and be open to listening to farmers when working with them? Yeah. Um, so one of the big things that we in this preliminary studies that I mentioned a couple of times now that we're finding is that um, signaling your own transparency and bias is really important. Um, being being transparent about about that is what I mean. So so if you have bias, which we all do, being honest about that, 
right? Someone asked the question about um, the sample size, right? And I am very clearly trying to be transparent about that. Like there are limitations in our sample and we recognize that. Um, and I think that that is, is really important because um, studies, the, stu the study that I'm doing right now suggests that, that signaling your transparency is more important than other tools that we use as scientists to signal our trustworthiness and credibility. For example, one of the things that scientists do a lot, and I've done a lot on this talk, is I hedge, right? Oh, well, this data is really new, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that, right? I want to tell you, but I can't because we don't have the answer to that yet. Um, or maybe, or possibly, right? Or it's a correlation, not a causation, right? All of that are examples of hedging, which I've done a lot, right? And this is something that scientists, including myself, do to protect our credibility. Because what happens if another study comes out and totally contradicts my study? And then here I am on record saying, this was the result. And I, you know, uh, I, I, I throw my hat in the ring on this result. Uh, and you hear scientists and technical sources doing that all the time. Hedging is a really common way to protect our credibility. But when we've looked, um, and these again are preliminary data, when we've looked at hedging as a strategy to protect your credibility versus being really transparent about your bias, it seems to me that transparency about bias is a more effective strategy for building trust. Meaning that when you look at a message that is being transparent versus a message that is hedged, participants found the message that is transparent much more persuasive and uh, it increased the perceived credibility of the source. And so I do think that this idea of being transparent about your bias, wherever it is, is really important. Um, and I also think listening um, to other people's biases and maybe not agreeing with them necessarily, because you might feel differently. But I sort of, I guess I said to my son the other day, I said, you know, you don't have to understand something to believe it. You, you you can you can say I believe that that's your reality without saying that I agree with you right and so how do you thread that needle I think is something that I don't have a great answer for but it is something that I think about a lot like if if someone else's lived reality is different than my lived reality is there a way that I can say I understand where you're coming from and at the same time it's okay for us to disagree on that right and so I think that is really really an important part of this face-to-face, -face, place based conservation, um, this complex system that we're talking about. Um, a person just said that that's really interesting. Can you say more <laughs> about uh, the difference or the nuance between being transparent about limitations versus hedging? Yeah. Um, so what we're talking about with transparency is saying something like, um, you know, this, let me think of a good example of it. Okay, I'll take a, a context from risk communication, which is something that I teach about here at the university and I taught at Iowa State as well. Um, so the difference between being transparent and hedging is saying something like, um, we don't honestly know the answer to, uh, let's say we had a chemical spill. We don't know how far this spill has spread, but we are working extremely hard to get that answer to you. But being honest about like, we don't know, like, legitimately, we don't know this is a fast moving situation. We don't know. Or saying, um, look, we are making a, a conscious choice here to prioritize human health. There are other things we could prioritize here. We can prioritize environmental health. We could prioritize uh, uh, freedom. We could prioritize, and what I mean is um, like the freedom for people to move around. We could prioritize uh, business interests, but right now we are making a conscious effort to prioritize human health. That is our choice. Um, and it's a subjective choice, but it's a choice. And so that is very different than saying, you know, human health is the only option here, right? Um, or that is very different than saying, um, we might have an answer for you on this, or we might be able to tell you this, or we think um, and I, and again, these are really nuanced things that we're just sort of trying to study um, now, but they seem to make a big difference. And scientists typically are taught to hedge in the scientific community, and they're taught to lead with the science. And that has a place in the scientific community, very much so. But when you're talking about interpersonal communication, um, especially with farmers and landowners, I think we need to lean more into here are my biases and, and here's why, here's how I'm working or here's how this, this, whatever it is, practice or, or 
initiative benefits you, or here's what I think the benefits would be for you. Um, and I, and again, I think that better meets their expectations. And also I think it seems to be a more effective strategy for communicating. Perfect. Okay. Um, another question is, did you ask absentee landowners the same questions as the farmers were asked in the survey? Um, I, I'm kind of thinking that you probably didn't know who was an absentee or anything like that. So then they're saying, if not, um, do you plan on doing something with that of like an absentee landowner versus people actively farming the land that they rent or own? I would love to do that. Um, I think the challenge is getting those lists, figuring out who those people are and how you engage them. And I, I know I've been part of conversations with other folks who study um, farmers in this context, and it's very, very hard from what I understand to get that information. Um, and we have the same challenges in Texas um, that just getting that information is not um, not easy. Perfect. All right. Well, there are a couple more questions, but in the interest of time, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up for the day because we've, wow, had a, almost a full hour of great discussion, which is really fantastic. Uh, so again, if you need to email me, my email is Elena, W-A-L-E-N-A-W at IASTATE.EU for a CCA CEU credit. Um, and then you can join us next week for pasture management following a drought with Denise Schwab. So Again, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you to Dara and Miguel. Uh, and with that, go ahead and.